Hey there guys, so today we're taking a look at this mini PC from Camrui, I think is how you pronounce it, but it is the E3B. Let me take this system out of the box and immediately the first thing that I'm noticing is the weight on it. Definitely has some heft to it. All right, let's take a look at the power adapter just to know how many watts we're looking at here. Okay, 65 watts. All right, that, that's kind of to be expected for the specs that we're looking at here. That is a 7430U and we'll talk about the specs of this spec specifically later on let's just see what else comes in here user manual base uh, mount of course the hdmi and the power adapter all right first thing i'm noticing immediately is that it does have a textured finish here and i really really like that i'm, I'm really digging what they did here the, this is a really nice design it feels great it looks great because you know, it, it's an all plastic chassis but it does not feel very cheap of course they give you the tip on how to set it up so that you avoid the whole horrific startup process for windows on most standard oem systems out there I noticed that there's a lot of mini PCs that have been doing this, and I, I appreciate that. Now, let's take a look at some of the I.O. going on here. Of course, we do have the power button in the front. I don't know if this is uh, audio in and out. Since it just says audio, I'm guessing it's a dual port. You have dual USB 3.0 in the front. We do have a USB-C. For that USB-C, I will have to see if it supports power. And, of course, display out. Now, is this a capacitive touch button? Is Like, look at this. L look at all the this and there's this here and it just says excellent performance so is this like a, a button like like why is this like this oh no no it's like that on the other side too i guess it's just a artistic choice what an odd thing to just put there of course the back we do have a four usb 3.0 ports a lot of usb going on here I'm, I'm a big fan of that i'm really digging that but of course it is single lan and they do put a sticker here to cover up the lan just to really emphasize to you do not not plug this in until after you've set up the system which i think again fair move very nice i appreciate that and of course i love to see it the dual display and hdmi instead of just hdmi hdmi or display port display port overall though it seems like a pretty rock solid design obviously we have to see how loud this thing is i don't know how easy it would be to get in here without ripping up these feet so i'm gonna test it out first and then we'll see about getting in here so to start things off we're going to be taking a look at cinebench r23 on this system and of course the ryzen 5 7430u is just the ryzen 5 5600u re-released so it scores at least single core wise well within the range of all zen 3 based systems so single core performance is going to be well in line with the 5600h 5600u 5800h and 6600h and that does mean that it's pretty much going to end up beating out most other lower end intel systems in this price point moving on to multi-core performance it also falls well in line with its siblings though this is a tdp limited situation where it ends up scoring similar to the 5600h that i have on here but the 5600u that i have benchmarked on here ends up scoring a lot closer to the 6600h that's because that 5600u had a tdp of 45 watts while this system is capped to 30. And you're not really gonna find any solution to that problem. The BIOS itself is very limited. There's not really much going on here at all. You don't have any options to really configure anything in terms of the CPU power. You can't configure how much RAM is allocated to the iGPU, which, which is not really a deal breaker. It really is only a problem in a handful of games. But overall, this is a very limited BIOS and it's very disappointing to see. You can, of course, control things like secure boot but outside of that there's not really much you can do in the bios itself but in terms of gaming performance jumping into counter-strike 2 running with the lowest in-game graphics settings at 1080p but with no fsr enabled we're getting about the level of performance that you should expect for any system running on a radeon vega graphics chip considering it's a vega 7 it's not even the best that you can possibly get so the level of performance here is going to be for the most part pretty mediocre especially considering that this is a relatively light title, but you do have to remember that this is just a re-released 5600U, which itself is not a bad CPU. It's just that this iGPU is getting pretty dated. It's gonna be more powerful than most things that you find at this price point, but you're gonna have to put some pretty realistic expectations here. 
Still, that does mean that you're gonna get a pretty great experience out of titles like Mountain Blade 2 Banner Lord here running with the low graphics settings. At the full 1080p resolution, we're able to get a pretty decent experience. An FPS average of 57 and 1% lows of 44 do mean that we are going to get a pretty consistent experience in this title. Now, visually speaking, it doesn't look great, but considering the hardware that we have here, the fact that we're getting a playable experience is pretty nice to see, especially because most things in this project price point are either going to perform about at this level or worse. And though I normally like to say that with these Vega based iGPUs, the way that they thrive best is as essentially a way to get a remastered experience for older consoles. With a game like Shadow of War here, you can see that the performance, even at the lowest graphics settings at the full 1080p resolution, is not exactly spectacular. So you have to go pretty far back in age if you want to be able to get a good experience for an iGPU like this. So this really isn't the type of system that you're buying because you plan on using the graphics chip, but it does still come in better than any other system at this price point, especially because even systems that you'll find that have the 6600H, which I do recommend over this in general, at this price point, a lot of the times you're gonna find that they come with single channel memory, which means you are going to have to upgrade it if you want better performance than this, because in single channel memory, a 6600H is going to perform worse than the 5600H, which that's what this is, or rather 5600U. But you can see here with Resident Evil 5 that at the high graphic settings and 2X MSAA, we get fantastic levels of performance, so you can get some great gaming out of here. You just have to go really far back towards the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 era to really find the games that play well with this. So as you can see, it's not exactly earth shattering levels of performance it's not anything unique but there are some aspects of it that i do like for one i do think that it is a great chassis design it looks great it feels great in the hand though i do think that the 32 gigabyte version is kind of overkill for most people because the 32 gigabyte version comes in at a price point where 6600H systems are very readily available. And though most of those are gonna be coming with 16 gigabytes of RAM, chances are that's going to not really matter all that much. If you're shopping for something at this performance tier, I'm assuming that you really don't care all that much about 32 gigabytes of RAM. In which case, I would consider the 16 gigabyte version of this instead, and that is a lot more compelling of an option because at least as of right now it's 263 on amazon and at 263 it's a lot more compelling because now we're talking about cpu performance that is comparable to, to the 6600h if you don't care about the igpu then there's no real difference between the radeon 7 in here and the 660m that is in the 6600h so at that point any price difference between this and a 6600 600H system just doesn't seem worth it. Because then it's real competition of systems with the N150, the Ryzen 7 4700U, the 5300U or the Ryzen 5 5500U and occasionally you'll find some 5600H or 5600U systems that are at this price point or cheaper and at that 200 to 275 dollar price point this is very competitive and again I do like the chassis and I really like the IO of course we have the very standard two USB at the front obviously we have the USB-C at the front not the biggest fan of the USB-C at the front I would have preferred that in the back but that's not really a deal breaker here we of course have the audio at the front that's not really the biggest deal because usually aux cables tend to be a lot easier to route to the back but really the big thing for me is just the inclusion of the four usb 3 this to me is a layout that is designed for people to actually use now you have the full four usb layout we have gigabit lan which while isn't great i am glad to see that it is only one because sometimes you'll see some systems that will have the dual lan and for me personally i like the dual lan it gives these systems a lot more flexibility in terms of what you could use them for but realistically speaking your grandma's never going to need a system that has dual LAN. You know, she's never going to be running dual Ethernet ports on a system like this. And unfortunately, what ends up happening there is that you end up with less USB to work with here. 
And that's one of the benefits of going with the single gigabit is the fact that you don't really sacrifice as many PIE lanes, so you're able to have a wider selection of IO. And of course, continuing that trend of making decisions that seem to be done because they expect people to actually use these things, we of course have the HDMI and the display port. So you're not forced to make a decision on which route you want to go there, you know? Overall, it's a very smartly designed system, and I really appreciate that aspect of it. Now, unfortunately, I'm pretty sure I do have to take off these feet to get in there, and I kind of I don't want to rip this thing apart right now. I'm not 100% sure on the expandability of this thing. Yeah, okay, by the looks of it, we, we do have to destroy the feet to get in there. I don't think that it goes in from the top. Although, now I'm really curious because if you see in there, I don't know if the camera can focus in. Okay, you could see there's, there's nothing there. Like, there's no fan that's using the grill that's here. <laughs> I don't know what's in there. So, okay, I, I have to get in there. I have to get in there. I, I can't just leave it like this. So I'm unfortunately going to have to rip off these feet. I really hate when manufacturers do this. I wish that they would just have the easy to remove feet because this, this is never going to go back the same way. Okay, there we go. There we, oh my God. Yeah, it is just a black straw that's there. What the hell? Okay, I guess this looks like the SSDs, right? Like this looks like a dual SSDs and that I'm guessing this is where the RAM is at. That's just so funny it's so funny because like they had to have just reused this chassis then because you know i mean this is there for no reason <laughs> I mean, that's not, it wouldn't be too surprising if, uh, if they have reused the chassis, that is something that a lot of these companies tend to do. They tend to reuse designs for pretty much as long as humanly possible. I mean, how many different releases of the Sur 5 from B-Link have we gotten so far? Okay, there we go. Yeah, okay, so it did have thermal pads on there, and I may have mangled one of them, but it's fine. Let's see what we got going on here. Okay, so we have dual 16 gigabyte sticks, obviously. So I'm curious then if at the 16 gigabyte version, if it only comes with one stick. Because here's the thing, I have been noticing that there is a trend of a lot of systems that use, you know, DDR4. They've been coming with single stick 16 gigabytes. And in general, it has been pretty hard to find 16 gigabyte kits of these that aren't just a single stick. It really seems like eight gigabyte DDR4 sticks are practically gone from the market now of course in terms of what we got to work with here we do have an extra m.2 slot and luckily they do label it here I, I really like this aspect they do label the fact that it is both pcie and it's a sata port and it is a full size port as well so again like i said the, the the design aspects of this i really really like there is really just a couple of nitpicks that i have now of course one of those nitpicks is this you know like that don't don't have me destroy the thing just to get in here you know because it's a win that they go with the full size M.2 that is both PCIe and it's SATA, very easily accessible here, very easy to upgrade. But then you have me destroy the, the system itself to get in here because these, these are not gonna go back on easily. It's just not, that's just not how these things work. They will never stick the same way again. So they're eventually going to end up popping off and then it's going to be uneven and then the other one's gonna pop off easily and then they're all going to end up getting lost eventually. But besides all that, having that second SSD port does also mean, though, that we can use this thing with a Oculink to M.2 adapter. And uh, I, I'm kind of tempted to do that. That's what we're going to do right now. There's just no way with such an easily accessible M.2, there's just no way we can't. Now, luckily for a setup like this, we're not going to have to put it all back together. But that does mean that I'm essentially going to have to use it sideways like this, which I'm hoping doesn't do anything to affect the cooling. I mean, it is one set of vents that is going to be essentially blocked, but that should be fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how this goes. So yes, I decided to set this thing up with an Oculink dock, and I'm fully aware that there are going to be some limitations here. Obviously, the biggest limitation is the fact that this is going to be running at PCIe 3.0 instead of 4.0, which means that the bandwidth limitation of a 4X M.2 slot is going to become even more apparent. So the RTX 2070 Super 
super that we're going to be using here is going to be even more limited. I'm very well aware of that, but I'm also very curious to see how this chip is going to pair with an Oculink dock. And well, unsurprisingly, it performs pretty well. In Shadow of War, we were able to run the game at the ultra settings at 1440p and we got a FPS average of 83 with 1% lows of 62. So a game where we were struggling to even run at the lowest possible settings at 1080p, we're now able to max out at 1440p. Really though, what an Oculink setup does for a system like this is that it unlocks a huge library of games that you normally wouldn't be able to play. For example, Marvel Rivals here. This is a game that normally would not run well on the Ryzen 5 7430U, but here it is running at 1440p at the low graphics settings with DLSS at the performance preset, and it's getting an FPS average of 74 with a 1% low of 42. Now, not amazing results considering the graphics settings that we're using, but still a fantastic result considering the fact that the game would not run well at all on the system by its default. But of course, the reality check is Spider-Man 2 here running with the medium graphics settings and DLSS, and it's set with a dynamic resolution scaling of 60 FPS. And well, I kind of forgot to start the benchmarking on this, so you won't be able to see the FPS average or the 1% lows, but you can tell by the frame time charts that this is not a great experience. There really was just very frequent fluctuations in the FPS, and from what I can gather, it really seems to be happening because of the fact that we're just super limited by our PCIe bandwidth here. Because I have played this game before on this graphics card on systems that have PCIe 4.0 M.2 slots and the performance was not anywhere near as bad as this is. So there's definitely some limitations here and if you for whatever reason do consider going with an Oculink setup to try to extend the life of an older mini PC, maybe don't spend too much on a graphics card. But overall, I do think that this is a pretty interesting system. More so in the sense that it feels like it was designed with the idea of people actually using it. And that's really the most interesting aspect of it. Obviously, specs wise, we're not looking at anything revolutionary in terms of price point. The 16 gigabyte version is really the only one that makes any sense. But I get the feeling that the 16 gigabyte version might come with single channel memory, in which case that starts to complicate things a little bit more. I really wouldn't say that there's anything particularly amazing about this system that would get you to really rush out to buy one. If you need an everyday system and you know that you will never need the dual LAN, you'll never need 2.5 gigabit ethernet, you don't mind a front-facing USB-C, and of course you want the easy expandability of dual NVMe that is very easy to get to, I do think that there is a compelling option here. It's just that at the price point that it comes comes in, it's nothing that I would really say stands out too much. That said, we do have Prime Day coming up soon, and there might be some deals going on for this system, so if you're interested in that, check out the links down below. But overall, I'm impressed with the system, I really like it, and I'm gonna get this thing back together now. So I'll catch you guys in the next one.